I'm running for president. Everyday Americans need a champion, and I want to be that champion. I'm hitting the road to earn your vote, and I hope you'll join me on this journey. Now, there are some who have a different view, as you all know. They seek an international legal instrument that would lead to exclusive government control over Internet resources, institutions, and content, and national barriers on the free flow of information online. But this, in our view, would lead to a fragmented Internet, one that does not connect people but divides them, a stagnant cyberspace, not an innovative one, and ultimately a less secure cyberspace with less trust among nations. They should not be prevented from sharing their innovations with global consumers simply because they live across a national frontier. That's not how the Internet should ever work, in our view. Not if we want it to remain the space where economic, political, and social exchanges can flourish. We have an expression in our country, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. It would be misguided, in our view, to break with the system that has worked so well for so long. The digital marketplace of ideas that welcomes every blog and tweet is the same one that inspires the next generation of innovators to fuel our economies. And when businesses consider investing in a country with a poor record on Internet freedom, and they know that their website could be shut down suddenly, their transactions monitored, their staffs harassed, they'll look for opportunities elsewhere. that we understand policy is not abstraction, that there's a human soul behind our policy choices. There's a human being behind every one of those line items in our budgets. There is a, an aspirant, somebody with hopes, dreams, struggles, who is not looking for government to solve every problem in their life, who just wants government to help them help themselves. That's what makes us Democrats. That is why I am proud to support this movement. And that is who the next governor of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts will be in Martha Coker. for those 17,000 kids waiting to get early education. We know how important it is. Waiting. Folks who don't have our sick time, most of us don't worry about that, but a lot of people in Massachusetts do. That's important to people. And that says what I care about, what you care about, what we care about as Democrats. That we want to make sure we give every kid an opportunity to find his dream and follow it. And I was talking today up in Lynn about this kid I met at the Lynn Vocational Technical School. I said, I met this kid. He was a real kid, by the way. <laughs> I met this kid in Lynn, and he never thought he would go to college. 
But he told me in his senior year, he had a four-year scholarship, electrical engineering, to Bucknell. And he was so excited because he was getting the education here in Massachusetts that was going to give him that opportunity. <laughs> my dad went to college, worked his way through college. I got to go to law school. My mom never even got to go to college. I know, and you know, that the key to turning this around, not just for the people in Massachusetts, because that's the right thing to do, good education, opportunity to go to a two-year school, a four-year school, Everybody should have that chance. And you know what the best news is? When we do that, it means we're investing in their future and our future. Because right. we're going to keep jobs here because we have the workforce to do them. which is the only thing that survives our so-called reset, trying to improve our relations. It's called the New START Treaty. After a major terrorist attack, every society faces a choice between fear and resolve. The world's great democracies can't sacrifice our values or turn our backs on those in need. Therefore, we must choose resolve. And we must lead the world to meet this threat. Now let's be clear about what we're facing. Beyond Paris, in recent days, we've seen deadly terrorist attacks in Nigeria, Lebanon, Iraq, and Turkey. And a Russian civilian airline destroyed over the Sinai. At the heart of today's new landscape of terror is ISIS. They persecute religious and ethnic minorities, kidnap and behead civilians, murder children. They systematically enslave, torture, and rape women and girls. ISIS operates across three mutually reinforcing dimensions. A physical enclave in Iraq and Syria, an international terrorist network that includes affiliates across the region and beyond, and an ideological movement of radical jihadism. We have to target and defeat all three. And time is of the essence. ISIS is demonstrating new ambition, reach, and capabilities. We have to break the group's momentum, and then it's back. Our goal is not to deter or contain ISIS, but to defeat and destroy ISIS. But we have learned that we can score victories over terrorist leaders and networks only to face metastasizing threats down the road. So we also have to play and win the long game. We should pursue a comprehensive counterterrorism strategy, one that embeds our mission against ISIS within a broader struggle against radical jihadism that is bigger than any one group, whether it's Al Qaeda, or ISIS, or some other network. An immediate war against an urgent enemy and a generational struggle against an ideology with deep roots will not be easily torn out. It will require sustained commitment in every pillar of American power. This is a worldwide fight, and America must lead it. Our strategy should have three main elements. One, defeat ISIS in Syria, Iraq, and across the Middle East. Two, disrupt and dismantle the growing terrorist infrastructure that facilitates the flow of fighters financing arms and propaganda around the world. Three, harden our defenses and those of our allies against external and homegrown threats. Let me start with the campaign to defeat ISIS across the region. The United States and our international coalition has been conducting this fight for more than a year. 
It's time to begin a new phase and intensify and broaden our efforts to smash the would-be caliphate and deny ISIS control of territory in Iraq and Syria. That starts with a more effective coalition air campaign with more allied planes, more strikes, and a broader target set. A key obstacle standing in the way is a shortage of good intelligence about ISIS and its operations. So we need an immediate intelligence surge in the region, including technical assets, Arabic speakers with deep expertise in the Middle East, and even closer partnership with regional intelligence services. Our goal should be to achieve the kind of penetration we accomplished with al-Qaeda in the past. This would help us identify and eliminate ISIS's command and control and its economic lifelines. A more effective coalition air campaign is necessary, but not sufficient. And we should be honest about the fact that to be successful, airstrikes will have to be combined with ground forces actually taking back more territory from ISIS. Like President Obama, I do not believe that we should again have 100,000 American troops in combat in the Middle East. That is just not the smart move to make here. If we've learned anything from 15 years of war in Iraq and Afghanistan, it's that local people and nations have to secure their own communities. We can help them, and we should. But we cannot substitute for them. Miss President, it is such an honor to have you on the show. Thank you, David. It's a real pleasure to be here. What motivated you to desire the most powerful position in the land? I sought this position of power with the intention of doing great things for the world. And America, of course. Cool. They hate us because we are so free. What do you think about former President Obama's Indefinite Detention Act, which severely limits the Fifth Amendment right to due process? That is a very racist thing to say, David. Okay. Can you pretend I asked that question about a white president? What are your thoughts on blowback? Do you attribute any of America's unpopularity to us being on this constant killing rampage? David, I'm simply not going to answer rude questions. I'm going to give all of you greedy monkey peasants a bunch of free stuff so you can really understand how benevolent I am. See these tears in my eyes? Hold on a second. See these tears? They are for the children. What children? The ones our military has killed in Libya, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, or Yemen? No, no, no. Those are the sons and daughters of America-hating terrorists. I mean the children in America who are now hooked on gov- I mean, the ones who would starve without food stamps and welfare checks. David. We both know you are completely ignoring the approved questions list that my people gave your people. I think I see your tears now. Let's hear a round of applause for the President of the United States. Thank you. Thank you all. about something else. Can you please answer one more question? Sure, David. Have you heard of Mars, the Roman god of war? Why, yes.